Well, as you can see, this is the time where we dismiss the children and they go off to the classrooms that are prepared for them. And so if you're new with us and you're wondering uh, where they're all going, that's where they're going. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a wonderful opportunity this morning to, to come to God through his word. Um, one of the unique things about gathering together as a church is that we, we sit under the word of God. We, we feel like this is, not feel, we know that this is God's word. We trust that it's his word. We trust that he still communicates through his word to us. And so um, it's our regular custom to, uh, to work through books of the Bible systematically. We've been in the book of Matthew for uh, a number of months and, um, and we'll finish it up. Uh, Lord willing, in due time, but, um, but we felt like it was necessary to pause and to take a break from Matthew and to do a, a short series um, through the, the, at least the first half of the book of Daniel. And so we're going to start that this morning with kind of an introductory message, um, and we'll, we'll be in the book of Daniel starting next week and through the end of July. But the reason... The reason in my heart and mind why I felt like it was necessary to do that was because of just the way that our country is right now. The things that uh, we all read about and hear about and watch in the news and um, trying to make sense of and have a, a framework in our minds for um, how to live in these days. So the message this morning is in, entitled, Embracing Our Calling as Citizens of Heaven. The reality is, as we'll see plainly laid out in scripture, that we as Christians, if we have uh, placed our trust in the Lord Jesus, if he has cleansed us with his blood and, and made us uh, his own, then we belong to him. And we'll see that as we move forward in these passages, but uh, we are called citizens of heaven. And so the first point, as we unpack this, we're gonna be in the New Testament and we're gonna look at four different passages that unpack this same idea, this point of being a citizen of heaven. I want you to understand theologically, doctrinally, your calling as a Christian and what that means. And then we're gonna look a little bit more practically at how that fleshes itself out living here, in this case, in the United States. But, but these principles are true no matter where you live. So if the Lord moves you to Afghanistan or to Mexico or to Russia or wherever you might move uh, in the months to come, these truths are the same. And so the first text we're gonna look at is uh, on the lips of Jesus because the New Testament authors are abundantly clear on this issue. Um, John records for us the words of Jesus in John chapter 17. So in turn there, John chapter 17, it's, it's titled, or at least in my Bible, the High Priestly Prayer. Just hours before Jesus was going to be uh, crucified, handed over and crucified, he prayed to his Father in heaven for his disciples, for himself first and for his disciples, and then for us who would believe in their message and in the midst of that prayer, he says something that is pivotal to us understanding our calling, who it is that we are called to be and whose we're called to be. So let me start reading in verse uh, 13. Jesus says, but now I am coming to you, speaking to the Father, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves, they in themselves as the disciples. I have given them, the disciples, your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. In the midst of this prayer, as Jesus is praying for his disciples, he knows that he's about to go back to be with the Father. He knows that he's going to leave the disciples to carry on the work. He'll send the Holy Spirit, but him physically, presence, his physical presence will be removed from them. And he wants them to be prepared. He wants them to be ready. He knows full well the trials that will face them as they go out to do his work, as they go out to do what he is commissioning them to do, they're going to face all kinds of trials and difficulties. You can read about it in the book of Acts. 
And in this passage right here, in this prayer that they're probably listening to, he's always instructing them, even when he's praying for them. In this prayer, he lays out not only the, the disciples, what their identity would be, but what our identity, what our identity is as well. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. We see, at least in the mind of Jesus, and recorded for us by the Apostle John, that Jesus looked upon the world and saw two categories of people. He saw two categories of people. We look upon the world and we see all kinds of categories of people. But in the mind of Jesus, he saw those who were his and those who were not. Those who belonged to him and those who belonged to the world. Elsewhere, he tells the Pharisees, you were of your father, the devil. So the disciples who belong to Christ, their father is the God and father of heaven and earth. But those in the world, their father is the devil. And this shouldn't catch us by surprise. If we're students of the Bible, we can go back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 and find out how we got into this mess in the first place. Everything was as it should be. Everything was perfect and glorious and wonderful. Mankind was there, man and woman, in a beautiful setting that God had made. They were doing the work that God had called them to do and entered in to the picture one who had an alternative message. The serpent, that crafty and wily serpent who offered up to the woman first some questions and then an alternative truth. And because of her deceived, because she was deceived, because she took of the fruit and ate that which God said don't eat of, and because her husband who was with her chose to follow along, we are in the predicament that we're in. Separated from God, separated from our Creator, and Jesus comes into the world and he, he recognizes immediately some people belong to God and some don't. This is important for us to notice. This is important for us to, to think about biblically because in our world, we think about categories as, as broad and wide and lots of them. We have categories for different Christians. We've created so many gray areas in our world that don't exist in the Bible. In the mind of Jesus, there are those who belong to him and there are those who belong to the world. And the key distinction, the sole distinction between those two categories of people is one thing. It's the word of God. Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Those go together. The reason the world hates the disciples is because of God's word. The reason the world hated Jesus and ultimately crucified him is because he came as a true representative and spokesperson for the word of God. I know even as I say this, I know that in your mind you're struggling to accept this because you, you live in a country that has been so uniquely blessed. We are so blessed here. And for generations, people have lived by certain Christian principles, even if they totally rejected the Christian message. The principles of God's word have been woven into the fabric of our society. And so you have good, decent neighbors that work hard, they just want to take care of their families. They just want to enjoy life. They're not out to harm anybody. They don't want to do evil to anybody. They don't have any, any, any uh, hardness toward God, at least on the surface. And so it's easy for us to look out and say, well, maybe there are different categories. But according to the Bible, according to Jesus, there are simply two. We see this even as we've been studying through the book of Matthew, there are obviously those hard-hearted Pharisees, those hypocrites that stand opposed to God's word and stand opposed to Jesus and his message. 
And they're obviously defiant in their opposition to him. It's easy to see their anger and their animosity toward God. But within that, that category of the world, there are, there are also the crowds who are often associated with Jesus. They're there when he's doing his miracles. They're there when he's feeding people. They're there when he's teaching. And they're onlookers and they're watching and they're wondering and they're, they're inquisitively thinking, I wonder if he is the Messiah. I wonder if he's just another prophet. I wonder if he's gonna give us another free meal. I wonder if my cousin can get healed. But all the while they're looking on and they have not yet come to surrender to him, they're a part of the world. And then there are those, the the disciples, those who have bowed the knees, so to speak, those who have uh, made that confession, the great confession there in Matthew 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You alone have the words of eternal life. They've crossed over from death to life, from world to disciple, and they're true followers of Jesus. I fear that in our country, one of the problems that you and I face, one of the difficulties that we face is because, as I said, hundreds of years ago, when the people gathered together in these lands and they decided to form their own uh, republic, they, they, they at least believed simply that the Bible was the word of God. It doesn't mean every one of them were Christian. Many of them weren't. They were deists. They thought that God, in a lot of cases, was just distant and was, was foreign, that he had no regard for us personally. But they at least had the awareness and the, the, the idea that God's word was true. And so they pulled from the Bible these principles and they wove them into the fabric of our great nation. And because of that, you and I have been privileged to live in the most blessed nation under heaven. You have received blessing upon blessing upon blessing, even if it's been laced with difficulty. The opportunities that we have, the the blessings that we've been given, it's unlike any other nation ever. But what we're seeing currently in our society is we're seeing those those threads that were woven into the fabric of our society. We're seeing people pull on those threads, trying to unravel those Christian principles because as our culture becomes more and more and more secular, they've been fed on a steady diet of secularism for the last generation or two. And now these principles of Christian living are are offensive to them. And so they're seeking to undo it all. And you and I are living in this day and we're watching it unfold. And we're trying to make sense of what does this mean? What I want you to realize is that this is not new. This is not a surprise to God. It's not that we were a Christian nation and now we're not a Christian nation. There were Christian principles and there were lots of Christian people in our country. But the reality is even those people, though it resided under the surface of their hearts and of their good deeds and good behaviors and hard work ethic, in their hearts they hated God. That's what Jesus says. The disciples have been set apart. Verse 17 goes on to say, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. When Jesus calls a sinner to himself, he places his word over them and that word begins to shape and mold them and they become less and less and less like the world that they're from and more and more and more like the heaven in which they're going to inherit. And more and more, they seem out of place. They seem out of touch with the world around them and they become more offensive to those who hate God. 
There may very well come a day in our country, in our lifetime, when we have to face similar things to what other Christians have been facing for thousands of years. But we've been spoiled for far too long. We've been lulled asleep in many cases by the blessing upon blessing upon blessing that has been given to us. But according to Jesus, we are distinct from the world because of his word. Because of his word. It separates us out. It marks us out for himself. We belong to him. This is in Jesus' mind, but it didn't end there. If you turn over to Philippians, in Philippians, we're going to see Paul had similar thoughts, which shouldn't surprise us. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's just parroting and passing along that which was given to him. But as Paul is writing to the Philippian church, mind you, from prison, because the world hates him, The world hates his message. The world hates his God. Paul is writing to this small band of Christians that are trying to live out their Christian existence in a foreign land as a people that don't belong where they are. Paul says this in verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence... I'm in the wrong text. Chapter three. That's a good text too, though. You should read that later. (laughs) Chapter three, verse 18. There we go. Let me start in verse 12, though. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I may... Uh, made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. That's also the wrong passage. It's in chapter 3, verse 17. Also a good text, though. (laughs) Verse 17. Brothers, sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. In Paul's mind, as he's writing from prison to this small band of believers who are trying to live out the faithful, uh, their faithful existence before God in heaven, Paul says there are two categories of people. There are the category of people who live for the the desires of their belly, the the passions and desires that are within them, just their carnal appetites, the, the things that make us up as people are their gods. Their minds are set on earthly things. They're moving towards destruction. And in contrast to that, we, our citizenship is in heaven. We need to draw a principle from what Paul is saying here because we don't belong here, because we, we've been bought out of this world, because we've been bought with a price, because the word of God has marked us out as his and not the world's, we belong to him. We belong to Jesus and we belong with Jesus. That's what Paul is saying here, that our citizenship is in heaven that we're, we're awaiting a day when Jesus will return for us. This is the rub of the Christian life. This is the, the, the nitty gritty of living out a Christian existence is that we're here, but we want to be there. It's challenging, it's difficult, especially in a country that has been so uniquely blessed. Because... 
In some ways, we have created a little utopia on earth. And for many, this this is probably the, the closest to heaven that any nation has ever experienced on earth. And for some, it's enough. It's enough to have freedom in the land. It's enough to have plenty of food. It's enough to have a a nice house with a white picket fence and a good job and a couple cars. It's enough. But for Paul, it wasn't enough. For the Christians in Philippi, it wasn't enough. And no matter how many things you could give them, they still were longing to be with Christ. This is the danger we face, church, in such a rich and prosperous land. Your heart yearns less and less to be with Christ because you become more and more comfortable here. It's a danger we all have to fight against daily. It creeps in like ivy. It just, you, you, you can watch it, but you can't see it happening. And then you turn back around and it's overtaken everything. Our hearts want to put down roots here. Our hearts and our minds long to just engage in all the things that the world engages in and enjoy all the things that the world enjoys. But according to Paul, we belong to Christ. He has purchased us with his own blood. We are his. And because of that, we belong with him. And if he's not here, I don't want to be here. And if he's there, that's where I want to be. Be careful, Christian. Be careful that the blessings of this life don't become trappings and temptations that hold you here and don't make you think of there. Be careful that the affections of your heart aren't given to just nice enough things, lesser things that aren't the true substance of Christ himself. According to Paul, our citizenship is in heaven. We live, and and not just us, but others in other countries as well, we live in a sense of like dual citizenship. We're here, in many cases we've been born here, or we've, we've become citizens here. This is our land, this is our country but we belong somewhere else. And in times of suffering, it's easier to recognize that. In times of suffering, we're like, yeah, I don't like it here at all. (laughs) But when times are prosperous and times are good, things are abundant, I've heard people say, I wanna go to heaven, but not right now. And if we were being honest, we would answer that way as well at times. Be careful. Moving on from Jesus to Paul to now Peter, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I don't have time to expound on all these texts, but I just want to give you a, a broad overstroke of the New Testament teaching of this concept. 1 Peter chapter 2, this is what was happening. My eyes were seeing 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, but I was in Philippians, so it's not my fault, it's my note's fault (laughs) that I wrote. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, beloved, in light of that, in light of the transfer of your your, uh, citizenship from the earth to heaven, In light of belonging now to God and in being an inheritor of all of these blessings, in light of that, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. 
Abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. According to Peter, there are two categories of people. There are those who belong to God and there are those who do not belong to God. Yet. But he he clearly has the idea in his mind that those who belong to God do not belong here. They live out their days or they ought to live out their days as exiles, those who are passing through, those who have a, a temporary residency. They're in a foreign land. Things seem foreign. Customs are different. Food is different. Longings and desires are different. They're sojourners. They have the idea of of passing through, moving on to a, a different land. This is the mindset of the apostles in the first century. This is the mindset that they passed on to the early church, and it's the mindset that w- which face- faithful Christians have been living out no matter what country of the earth they're on. The principle in this text that we need to draw out and tuck away in our hearts and cling to tightly is this. We live between two worlds. We live between two worlds. Our our heart is there with him. We long to be with him. We yearn to be with him. But our feet are planted here and we have to fill our days with activity. But more than that, there is a battle within Your desires, these new desires that Christ has placed in you when the Holy Spirit comes to take residence in you as a Christian, these new desires are at war with your earthly desires. And you live in a a constant state of conflict. Though we know peace like the world could never know, we're in constant conflict with our own lives. Because there's a part of you that wants that thing and there's a part of you that doesn't want that thing. And every day you have to make a decision. Are you gonna go after that thing? Peter here lays out for him two words, sojourner and exile. Both have the the distinct idea that they don't belong. They don't belong. But the idea overall is this, that we are at war. There are desires and passions within our own flesh that are trying to destroy us. The word of God has come into our lives. We've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God has sanctified us and set us apart. And evermore we're becoming more like Jesus the more we surrender to his word and the more we, he exercises his lordship over our lives. And as that's happening, we're, we're growing closer to him and farther away from the world. One more text in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Some think Paul. I think someone else, but it doesn't really matter. Jesus wrote it ultimately through the Holy Spirit. That's what's important. Hebrews chapter 11 carries on the same concept, the same idea of sojourning and exiles, of strangers passing through. This is the great hall of faith. This is the the section where the author lays out all of these individuals, both men and women who have gone before and who have exhibited great faith because they trusted in God and walked with God. And in verse 13, we read this. These all died in faith, not having received things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, 
that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. These individuals, in the, as in the case of Abraham, was given a promise, and he lived faithfully according to that promise. He continued to trust that God would fulfill the promise. All the way up into his old age, up even until the very day that he died, he was still hoping in and trusting in God to fulfill his promise to him. Noah, Sarah, Enoch, others who walked with God, who, who faithfully held on to and would not let go of the promise. And in this we have yet another principle. Because this promise is ever before us, we never fit in here. There will never come a day in your Christian life where you can say, this is it. We're home. Not until Jesus returns for you. Because ultimately your home is where he is. And so if in your mind you have the idea that if we were just to change some policies in our country then we could have a Christian nation again then we could have a, a wonderful place to live again and I, I'm all for a wonderful place to live but not at the expense of not hoping in Christ far too many Christians are more concerned with making more Republicans than Christians Abraham was still living by faith, still trusting in the promise, still holding on, clinging to the promise, and because of that, he considered himself a stranger. He's an alien, he's a foreigner. Take you from this land, put you in another land, it doesn't matter, your life stays the same. You might have to learn a new language, but overall your life stays the same because you're, you're living according to the principles of God and not according to the principles of a culture. The principles of God set us at odds with the things of this world, make us feel strange, make us stand out. But it's their calling. I want you to understand doctrinally, theologically, that this is your calling. If you have claimed the name of Jesus, if, you have, if he has washed you from your sin, if he, was, if he has made you new and made you his, then this is your calling. You will never feel right here. Accept that. Embrace it. There will be good times and there will be bad times, but we're longing for perfection. We're longing for a savior from heaven. Amen? Amen. So let's turn to the Old Testament. Now that we understand hopefully better our, under, or our, uh, our calling as citizens of heaven, we need to think through how do we flesh that out? What does that look like? Because we need to get very practical. We still live 24 hours a day here on this earth. We still have to make decisions every day. We still have to go to work. We still have to get up. We still have to do chores around the house, raise a family. All those things still have to happen. So what does God expect of us? And I think it's appropriate for us to look back into the Old Testament at an example of those who have gone before us. You see, in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was God's chosen covenant people. Unique, not like uh, America. America is just a bunch of people that came together. A lot of them had Christian values, but in the Old Testament, God selected a people and said, you're mine. As a nation, they lived under God as their king, or they were supposed to anyways, and unfortunately, they often failed. And because of that, God said, repeatedly warning them that I'm going to take you away from your land. I'm going to punish you, I'm gonna discipline you. And Jeremiah had the unique, wonderful privilege and burden of crying out to this nation for 40 plus years, leading up to the time and just into the time of the exile when Babylon came through and ransacked the city and took what they wanted. 
Jeremiah has been crying out for three decades. And all the while, the people will not repent. They don't believe him. They don't trust him. They think he's a lying prophet. But the time finally came. Babylon came to power, and in 605, they came through, marching through the whole region. They ransacked Syria, and they took over uh, the, the whole province of Palestine. But they largely left Israel alone. But then they came back in 597, and that's where they, they took several of the furniture, the gold furniture from the temple, and they took a lot of the uh, important people, people like Daniel and his friends, and took them away into exile. And now Jeremiah, who is left to remain in Israel, in Judah, is writing a letter to send forward to the people caught up in exile. So this is his letter. This is God's expectation for his people living in exile. Chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Here's what the letter said. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Pause. Already, God is teaching them. Already God is instructing them. Already God is laying out for them important principles and truths that we need to know and understand. You see, leading up in verse one, it's just uh, the, the narrator essentially, Jeremiah is saying, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent to the people in exile whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. That's exactly what happened. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the world. He was the most powerful man on the planet. No nation under heaven could withstand his force. And he walked through any land at will and he took what he wanted. It's exactly what happened in Jerusalem. He came through in 597 and he took what he wanted. The only reason he left people there is so they could live and make money and pay taxes. So Nebuchadnezzar did this. He took into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon. But down in verse four, this is what the Lord says. The God of Israel to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile. So wait a second. Did Nebuchadnezzar, the mighty king of the earth, did he take them or did God send them? Yes. Yes. And the truth behind that, that you and I need to tuck away in our hearts and never forget is this, that behind all the forces of the world, there is a sovereign hand of God in heaven. He will do as he pleases. No one will thwart his plans. No one will come against him. When our eyes are looking here on this horizon, we see kings and mighty people and strong people and wicked people, and we get so concerned about their evil schemes but when we raise our gaze up and we see the sovereign hand of God behind it all, do wicked men thrive? Yes. Does it irritate you? Yes. Is God sovereign over it? Absolutely. Why do wicked men prosper? Because God allows it. Why? Because it accomplishes his purposes. And in this case, he raised up Nebuchadnezzar to, to a place of strength that the world had never known before. And it was through this wicked king that he used to discipline his people, to bring them to a place where they would no longer worship idols, to teach them a valuable lesson about the glory of God and the sovereignty of God. 
What is God doing in America? I don't know. But make no mistake about it, he is working. He's not sleeping. He has not forgotten about us. He has not lost sight of what's happening. Everything will work out according to his plan. He is sovereign. This is a doctrine that Christians need to remember. Always remember, because when we flip through the media, when we watch things and when we see things happening and we get so spun up, and bent out of shape, it means we're not trusting in the sovereignty of God. These exiles have been stripped away from their homes, from their families, from their customs. They're, they're in a foreign land. Everything is different. And we're going to see over the next several weeks how Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived that out, what that looked like, living in a foreign land. But make no mistake about it, it was difficult. It was painful. They missed family. They missed home. They missed foods and, and all kinds of things. But they never lost sight of the sovereign hand of God. So that's principle number one, acknowledge the sovereign plan of God. If you are to live faithfully on this earth as a citizen of heaven, you need to acknowledge the sovereign plan of God. He is working, and he's working on your behalf. He has not forgotten about you. Number two, keep reading in the text here, verse five, this is the, the command, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find welfare. What does Jeremiah say? What does God say through the voice and pen of Jeremiah? Seek the welfare of the city in which you live. Settle down, build houses, plant vineyards, eat of its produce, get married, have children, have the, raise those children up, send them out to get married, and watch their children raise up and get married. Live out your days in this land under the sovereign plan of God and being faithful to him in it. The principle for us is simply this. Seek to be fruitful and productive. Here we are, living in America, living in a land that is not God's, living in a land that is growing ever increasing more wicked against God. How do we live? Well, be fruitful, be productive. Work hard, apply yourself. Make the most of your situation. Be a person of integrity. Honor God, glorify God. Live out your days. Don't be afraid, don't be anxious, don't be worried, don't be stressed out. Be productive and fruitful. This principle is not just an Old Testament principle dealing with, it, with Judah in exile. Paul says to the Thessalonians, love one another and aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may wa walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Aspire to live a quiet life. We get so caught up in things that don't really matter to us. We get so lured away and drawn, drawn away by things that uh, don't really matter matter to our sphere of influence. Everybody's become busybodies with the rise of social media, fretting about about things that literally don't matter. And I do it too. And Paul would say, live a quiet life, mind your own business, work hard, be fruitful, multiply, supply for yourself and for others. That's the principle we should tuck away. Seek to be fruitful and productive. But let's keep moving. Jeremiah has more to say. God has more to say in this letter. Starting in verse eight. 
I'll, I'll, let me back up. I need to say this too. Not only are we to be fruitful and productive, but we're to seek the welfare of the city in which we live. This is America. This is our land. This is our country. We ought to be fruitful and we ought to pray for our leaders and we ought to uh, pray and, and vote and do all those things to try and make it a better place. That's good and right. You just got to be careful not to think that you can create what only God can create. And if God so chooses to judge this land, don't be mad at him for it. Verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. There were many prophets in the days of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was not the only prophet, but he was one of the only voices that was speaking truth. The vast majority of the prophets in Jeremiah's day were speaking lies. They were uttering falsehoods. They were not speaking on behalf of God, and yet they came in his name. Listen to what Jeremiah says. Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. That puts the responsibility on you, the listener. Do not let them deceive you. There's a lot of emphasis on uh, false teachers and how we should silence them and all those things. But also, the listener needs to be responsible to not let them deceive you. How do you do that? You familiarize yourself with the truth. You have to know the word of God. Listen, our land is filled with false prophets. Christianity is a mess right now with, with voices that do not represent God. But they come in his name, they come wearing his clothing, cloaked in his sayings, and they sound very plausible. And all the while, people are being led astray. They're being deceived. And in some ways, this doesn't surprise me. Jesus said that in the end, there's going to be a great falling away. Paul said the reason there's going to be a great falling away primarily is because people will fall in love with themselves. They'll stop loving God because they'll fall so much in love with themselves. Rather than, than elevating in their minds and in their hearts the word of God and falling in love with the truth of God's word, they fall in love with all the great things that they have. Doesn't that sound familiar? Here we are at the push of a button. We can have anything we want. Anything your hearts desire. And if you can't afford it, just put it on credit. You can have it now. More so than in any other time in human history, people are in love with themselves. In the false prophets, that's their message. Love yourself. God loves you too. He would never want you to feel bad. In Jeremiah's day, they mocked him, they ridiculed him, they beat him, they threw him in a, a dungeon, a pit, because he was saying God's going to judge this nation. Because he was saying that God is going to raise up the Babylonians to conquer us. And when they come, you need to submit to them. And the false prophets of the day were saying, no, no, it won't happen. We're God's covenant people. It'll never happen to us. And when it finally did happen, the false prophets changed their message, which they often do. The false prophets changed their message to, it won't last very long. Hence Jeremiah telling them, you need to settle down. You need to build houses. You need to have children. You need to get married. Not in that order, but have, get married and then have children. Jeremiah saying, look, this is going to go on for a while. You need to just live out your days here. Most of you aren't coming home. You're going to be waiting all the rest of your life. But the false prophets were saying, no, no, God's going to destroy the Babylonians. It'll just be for a little while. And Jeremiah says, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. That's true today. 
There are false prophets everywhere speaking utter nonsense in the name of Jesus. They don't represent him. The principle is this. Be on guard against false prophets and false messages. How are you to live out your, your days faithfully in, an, in a foreign land? You need to first acknowledge the sovereign plan of God. You need to seek to be fruitful and productive, but you also need to be on guard against false prophets and false messages. Again, you could ask the question, and I have asked this question in my heart, why do you allow these false prophets, God? You're sovereign, you could silence them. And he allows them, it answers us in Deuteronomy, when this, when this stuff happens, it's because God is testing you to see if you will hold fast to his word. We're in a great test in our day in the Christian culture. There are thousands of voices, and most of them wrong. Will you believe the truth? Do you have an ear bent towards the truth? Is your heart and your mind inclined towards the truth? Or are you just going to take whatever they give you? Be on guard, church. Be careful. Lastly, as we finish up here, there's more to the letter, but we need to end our time. Verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon... I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. There's that wonderful verse that is so often taken out of context and made to, by the false prophets to sound like, God will give you whatever you want. As if God chooses his best plans for you based on what you want for yourself. No, that's not how it works. But does God have a future and a hope and a plan for his people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have derived, uh, driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Here's the last principle. Remember the goodness of God toward you. Remember the goodness of God toward you. He's given you everything he can already in the person of his son. His intentions toward you as his follower, as his child, are good even if you're in the fires of affliction right now. Even if our whole church comes under persecution. God is good, amen? amen? And his plans for us are good. And he will use even external pressures and difficulties to make us more like Christ and to make us more dependent on him. So rejoice. There's literally nothing the world can do to us. God is for us and who can be against us? This is God's plan. We are to live out our days as exiles in a foreign land. And even if this country in times past was, was very much aligned with the principles of God's word, the nation as itself still stands opposed to God. We are to live faithfully and obediently, lovingly before our, before our creator knowing full well that our citizenship is in heaven. As we live out those days, as we live out our pilgrimage here on this earth, the Lord Jesus has given us some reminders, some things to do to remind us, to, to always bring our minds back to the central truths of the gospel. And so this morning we get to participate in communion. Our church does this on the first Sunday of the month. We could do it more, we could do it less. It's not laid out for us exactly how to do it in scripture, but... Um, but this is what we've chosen to do. So here we are on the first Sunday of the month, and I just invite you to grab your communion cup and to pull back that top layer and reveal the cracker. And let me read for you from 1 Corinthians. This is not the apostle's idea. 
Paul and Peter and James and the others didn't sit around and say, what can we think of to do as a church that will help us remember our, our Lord? They weren't thinking up what to do. The Lord was giving them what to do, giving them instruction. And that's what Paul says here in chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Paul is just an apostle who has been commissioned by Christ to do a specific thing. He's just a believer that's been endowed with a special grace to carry on a special mission. And he gets his authority, he gets his instruction, he gets everything from the Lord Jesus. He is our king. That's where Paul gets his instruction and he delivers it on to the Corinthians and to other churches who eventually it was delivered on to us. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's do it together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for laying down your life. Thank you for being a stand-in for us. You bore the wrath of God so that we could go free. And we love you for it. Paul goes on, verse 25, in the same way about the cup. So go ahead and get the cup ready. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember him together. Lord, you are infinitely kind that you would become a sacrifice, that you would pour out your blood for us is, is absolutely staggering. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable message but we believe it and we thank you for it and we rejoice in it and because of that reality, we worship you and we long for you. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name, amen. Let's go forth and live out our pilgrimage faithfully.